It wasn't like labor wasn't moving ahead. But some, uh, partly because the Southerners were harassing the National Labor Relations Board so badly. But also they hit the tough, really tough nuts to crack uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, corporate community. What happened was the next thing that led to equality in America was World War II. World War II. Two ways. First of all, everybody's working or fighting. Working overtime. Rosie the Riveter. All of a sudden, African Americans have skills. They're, they're brought north. Every kind of thing. Everybody's working. That can do a hell of a lot to inequality. Secondly, they've got to tax these rich guys to pay for this war. And the effective tax rate went from the 20% I mentioned to you in 1944 is 54%. The rich people did pay a lot for this war. Mostly it was subsidized, but 22% of the war was paid for by the upper 1% or 2%. So they had to really tax them uh, to, to, uh, uh, to do all this. So the real plummet in inequality is during World War II and its slight aftermath. Now, another thing happened that's really important during World War II. You're not going to fight that war. When you're not, you didn't have a big military machine. They hadn't built a huge military. Uh, isolationists, they were called, it stopped them. It was very meager. And they had a militant union movement. A lot of ethnicity, a lot of things are going on. And basically the government said, big capitalists, you ain't going to fight those unions during this war. And the union movement grew from 9 million to 15 million. And in 1945, it hit its peak on union dens density, a number I've memorized, of course, 35.4%. That was the highest ever, right there square at the, as that war was ending. Well, at that point, of course, then uh, people had a lot of hope for this will continue. This will continue for liberal labor, except after the war, it really didn't. It really did backslide. They lost a lot of legislative battles in that time period. Um, and even though unemployment had stayed low in the 3%, 4% range, it popped up in 49.50 when they tried, oh yeah, we gotta balance the budget and worry about a little tiny bit of inflation and so on. And then, oh boy, that'll be a f miracle. And so, <laughs> who took a five minutes of my time there? At any rate, the, um, the important, actually the story as I said today, but the story really does end in about 72, the game is over. But you might say, oh, wait a second, there's all this important stuff we lived through. Which is true, but not in terms of the, uh, the power structure. The next thing, what happened? Korean War. Korean War. Got to tax the rich again. Got to get these people back to work. The unemployment goes as low as ever been since World War II. Never again. It was down 2.9% about 52 or 53. So everybody's working again. You're taxing the rich for the war. And in 53 was the point where the Gini coefficient, the inequality uh, coefficient, reached its lowest point, 1953. Now it starts up. The Republicans are in charge. The war's over. You can get the message, I've only got 10 minutes. Can you imagine I'm only in 1950? So, <laughs> so at any rate, the, uh, the things are going the wrong way again. Now comes the 60s. And in the 60s, I, I want to emphasize a couple of things to you about, about the 60s. Or, um, it's also about us or you know, some of us that are here uh, that we're, we're back then can think about this and and she would agree and so on and so forth. But the point is that in the 60s, Kennedy, you get the you know, country moving again, youth, you've heard all the images of Kennedy. But the real eyes were on the civil rights movement. That was the excitement, that was the action, that's what created uh, the northern uh, new left um, uh, and so on. Um, I got lost because I was going to mention somebody, but I, I can't, I don't have the, uh, the time here. The point is, then, that we're watching the civil rights movement like crazy. Kennedy is dragging his feet in all kinds of ways. But what we overlooked was he made two really good appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, and they made some rulings that really upset uh, the corporate guys. Now, the corporate guys had never. Uh, decided to have a deal with unions. They weren't satisfied. They were fighting them every minute. But now they were really up on their hind legs because of particular rulings that I don't have, obviously, then time to get into. 
Furthermore, during Kennedy's time, there was an executive order that was cautious, but it said public employees can unionize. And it wasn't, it didn't have all the little doodads that the union guys wanted, but it was enough. And public unions started up, and they started to grow. And there's still 37% of the uh, 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 public workforce is unionized. You know what it is for private? Six, seven percent right now. It's still 37 percent for, for the uh, uh, public employees union, but they're so damn small as a part of the workforce that only 10 or 11 percent of workers today are unionized from that 35.4 percent number that I mentioned to you. So furthermore, Kennedy knew in a more liberal way he was going to try what were called wage price guidelines, where the government would say, hey, don't raise those prices more than 2%. Don't ask for more than 2% in your contract, you workers over here. That was anathema to the workers, but also especially for business. So the point is, going on underground really was some tuss, tuggle, and struggle with the uh, corporate guys over the National Labor Relations Board, over public employee unions, over wage price guidelines, which never went anywhere. But the point is, he threw it out there, and they were afraid it, it might grow. So they really then resisted greatly, and, and that's why even moderate corporate people cannot be Democrats. That would just freak them out. So 1964 was the year of tremendous hope. LBJ won big. Uh, Goldwater was thrashed. The right was thrashed forever. Um, there was a lot of hope at that time. The Civil Rights Act had passed. And the Voting Rights Act was to pass the next year. And then there could be a, a black-white workers' coalition in the South. And there could be a national liberal labor coalition. It was the hope of the UAW. It was the hope of their leaders. It had always been their hope in helping uh, 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 Southern, Southern African Americans was if they could vote, we could get a liberal labor coalition. What, went, what was the hope? What's the base of this hope that turned out not to be so, so right? I think it's important that we really believed. I say we. There are a lot of people. People of the 60s believed a couple of the next three or four things I'm going to say, depending whether they were liberals or leftists. They believed that liberal ideology, the fact that we were melding pot and all that kind of talk, would eventually normalize also race relations. After all, they normalized ethnic relations. All the, the unmeldable white ethnics all of a sudden started to intermarry each other like crazy in the 70s and, and beyond. So that was going to happen. That was a liberal ideology. Social psychologists uh, do studies, sociologists, studies showing people hang out together, they get used to each other, they, you know, they get to like each other. There was all that kind of stuff. And perhaps most importantly, we all kind of believe people would vote their pocketbook, right? They had in 64. Surely these schmucks in these unions, the worst schmuck in the world is not going to vote for a Republican, right? He knows the UAW could get crushed. Surely he would know that. So rational, our thing about what's rational for them would be to vote for Democrats, even though they don't like black still, maybe. Okay. So none of those really turned out to be so true when it came to race relation. Basically what happened, heavy statement because this is saying the other side of the triumph, the wonderful things that happened from the civil rights movement, everything it did, it totally dynamited the uh, New Deal coalition. It dynamited the whole power structure basically because of that. Uh, because uh, in the South what happened we all know, the Southern whites all went pretty quickly into the Republican Party. LBJ told us that. We should have listened to him. When he signed the uh, Civil Rights Act, he said, we can kiss the South goodbye for a couple generations. You know, so his, his thing was, I didn't use quite his words, but that was the, uh, the sentiment. But he certainly knew that that was uh, going to happen. And the reason it didn't happen faster was that these Southern Democrats still controlled the Congress. You must understand that. They controlled all the key committees. They're not going to just quit. They control a party at that congressional uh, kind of, <coughs> of a level. And that mattered to them on this spending stuff that I've already uh, told you about. So the South deserted. Uh, but one other thing that happened was tremendous clashes between black and white workers, especially in unions. 
And this was most all of all in the craft unions. The craft unions would simply not let black people in their apprentice programs and in their union. Um, and that really created dynamite in these northern cities. But the second thing was, if you look at something like the UAW, very few of the craft workers, in the, the skilled workers they were called, in the UAW were black. More, you know, industrial, on the line, they were mostly, that's where black people were. They were that doesn't mean all those workers were black, but it sure means that's where black people were. Black people could sure see that kind of thing. So the result was it dynamited the liberal labor coalition because just enough white people started to vote Republican. Just enough. Now, I'm not saying all because there were people that changed their minds and their attitudes and so on. But the UAW files say that half of their workers in key places were voting Republican by 1968. And in 1968, 60% uh, of whites had voted for uh, uh, LBJ, and it was 40% of whites voted for uh, uh, Humphrey. Uh, and in Ohio and in in Illinois, 8 to 10% of people voted for the racist from the South named George Wallace, who was running on a third party ticket. Those, those weren't black people voting for that ticket, I will tell you that. These were white workers voting, of, you know, all classes were voting. That gives you an idea. And of course, the fact they didn't vote for Democrats meant was one of the reasons that Nixon won. Well, at this point, once Nixon's in office, he can change this National Labor Relations Board, and he does. And they make decisions that are very detrimental. Uh, to labor and make it really possible for what was called outsourcing, which is when you take the work out of a factory, now you can offshore it. You don't just outsource it, you send it to somewhere else. Uh, and so that's the power thing that matters, not, oh, there's better communication, or there's better transportation. Yeah, there's those, but there's also this ability to just walk right over uh, unions, ordinary people, when you send work overseas. They don't get any cut of the action. You don't charge a tariff on the uh, re-imported goods that are all American goods made uh, somewhere else. So this defeat in this time period, 68 to 72, was, was uh, tremendously important then in changing. Now there's one other part to this. And I know I'm going over time, but what can you do when you've got an academic wound up and he doesn't get to teach very often? And <laughs> <laughs> oh. So... The point is that in 68, 69, the economy is really heating up. And it's one of the, it's once again, almost as good a time, unemployment-wise, as it was in the Korean War. Not quite, but it was pretty low. Everybody's working. We're coming on the line. You go get a job anywhere. Drop out of school. You get a job. Yeah, professors' jobs are everywhere. Big deal. So on. I mean, so it was really a, a tight labor market. But in that context, as inflation took off, and they tried to do a moderate conservatives actually said, let's raise taxes on people. That's the best way to do it. That, that's the way to solve inflation. Conservative voting coalition said, no, we ain't going to do it that way. We're going to solve inflation on the backs of ordinary people. We're going to screw them because their wages are going to remain the same, and inflation is going to happen. They wouldn't raise taxes. Now, you got a choice then. You can raise, you can kill inflation another way. You can raise interest rates. And that's what they were forcing as a policy choice because you raise interest rates and you automatically create unemployment through no housing starts, this and that, no inv less investment, and so on and so forth. So these construction unions were driving them crazy in 69, 70 because as inflation happened, then construction unions got cost of living range raises. So you'd see headline, you know, Carpenters get 20% raise, you know, plumbers in San Francisco now making 30% more than they used to and all of this, you know. Well, damn, workers are causing inflation, you see, uh, was the way that they put out the blame. And with the Republicans in charge, and this is again key, they could then jimmy with the Department of Labor so that they could bring in people of color and bigger apprentice programs to undercut these white construction unions. And they did. They succeeded. And this was the origin of what was called the Business Roundtable. They started as the Construction Users Anti-Inflation Roundtable. 
So if people tell you that they organized because they were up upset about the environment or OSHA or envir you know, regulation, I, I think they're all wet. And they're all liberals, and they're, it's, it's Jacob Hacker. I wasn't going to say that, but it's Hacker and Pearson. If you believe winner take all uh, that book or anything like it, then you believe the opposite of, of what I'm saying here uh, uh, today. But they did then really do a job on these uh, construction unions as well in that particular kind of point. That was really the ball game right there. From then on, from 1969 on, the inequality ratchets up, and the unions are going down, a little bit masked by the rise of the public employee kind of union. Now, hope still sprang eternal. The Watergate Congress, in came a very liberal Congress in 74. But it wasn't quite liberal enough, and the Democrats said, we don't quite have enough to win. We're going to wait till 76. We'll make some procedural changes. So no legislation of any importance happened from that Congress of 74, 76. And then Carter won. And then that, okay, that will swallow. He's a born again, and everybody swallowed hard, but you know, he's a Democrat and this and that. But the conservative voting coalition was strong enough by then because of this why more whites became Republicans, and nothing happened that was uh, positive for liberal labor. Basically, the Carter administration was an absolute rout for the Liberal Labor Coalition. It was an absolute destruction those years. Cut, tax cuts, everything. But the bigger deal, of course, was then in came Reagan. But we now overlook that uh, previous cuts. And Reagan then came in. And we all know, I think from myth or actuality, that he shredded the labor movement. He, Made some appointments to the National Labor Relations Board that were so openly hostile to unions, so openly wild people, that it's hilarious to read about them. And they all hated each other, but they finally would all vote against the, they, they would just write us at each other. Um, they all voted then to destroy the unions. Other things were destroying um, the unions as well. The other thing, of course, they did was to, you know, huge tax cuts, because that's what's killing us, was huge Bush cuts, huge Reagan cuts. Uh, can't run the government without money, but their whole goal is to starve uh, the government. But the point I want to make to you is that even with Reagan in the presidency, and even with uh, a stronger conservative voting coalition of Republicans, they couldn't have won. They couldn't have won these things if all Democrats had stayed with them. But by then, the Southern Democrats were open about what they were. And it was, it was called the Conservative Democratic Forum in the one house, one branch of Congress, and the Conservative Democratic or Democratic Conservative Coalition in the other. And so there were a dozen or 14 senators that were in this, 12 of them from the South, and one from Arizona, and one from Nebraska. There were 47 House Democrats that were in this openly conservative coalition, 43 from the South. Four from rural areas, upstate New York, Nebraska, Arizona, you know, who are trivial. But the point is, you, again, now, you're still the same south, north, um, not moderate conservatives, not liberal labor, were voting together. Ultra-conservatives were voting together, and they'd been strengthened by this racist religious backlash that then came to dominate uh, Congress. And, and that really was, and I was going to end with this by saying that really was the ball game right there. Uh, but then that's, if anybody under 30 or 50, they, well, God damn him, he's leaving us out and there's all these struggles and there were wars and everything else. But what were the big issues? That, well, there was NAFTA and there was normal trade with China. What did they do? They finished off the uh, union movement. Um, there was the end of welfare as we know it. And today, right now, there are people going to starve. Uh, because uh, uh, we don't have um, the um, uh, 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 welfare as we knew it from the 30s uh, on, onward. The Bush tax cut was certainly a big deal, and it all got baked in by the Democrats, 98% of it by 2009, and the rest of it in the last deal, except for the top half percent, and they got some of their tax uh, restored. So everybody, so the government's locked out of, out of money. That's the, the key point of, of those cuts. Um, and we did get Obamacare. Obamacare is a major change. 
and to read in the paper is very moving for me to read about a woman in West Virginia saying, you can't tell you what a load it is off my mind to know I have protection. That's what liberal labor has always been about. It's been about that kind of compassion, that kind of empathy with others. And there's all kinds of evidence that people have had a huge load off their mind uh, and will get care for the first time because of Obamacare and expansion of Medicaid, which of course the southern states and the Great Plains states aren't going to let happen in their goddamn state, right? So that's a dramatic change. But I want to say to you, it's not a liberal labor change. Liberal labor said, we want single payers, was called, which should have been called, and is often called Medicare for all. That's what we want, Medicare for all. Extend it down 10 years. Extend it down for anybody that's worked for 20 years and suddenly laid off without a job. Extend Medicare to them. Uh, we didn't get that. We got Obamacare, which is run through the private insurance companies and uh, will cost the country in general extra because it's enormously enriching this whole medical uh, industrial uh, kind of complex. So I think that's where we are. I think because um, um, it some, in some ways sounds like a gloomy message, um, even though it's a class struggle message, it's a class struggle that says it was lost by workers for a variety of reasons, but certainly with race as a huge factor in that uh, loss. Um, but I've, so I reread uh, Mills's answer to his critics on the power elite and his critics from the left. And he said, and, and they had all said, well, it's gloomy, it's elitist, it's this and that. And he said, you know, he said, it seems like they're judging the reality of this analysis on the basis of an optimism pessimism uh, dimension. And, and Mills had this great quote and, that I always have liked. And he said, you know, he said, he said, from my point of view, he says, first, I want to get it straight. He said, I want to get it straight. And then, if it's cheerful, great. If it's not cheerful, that's too bad. But I think we've got to get it straight. And that's my best straight shot right at you today. Thank you very much. Glad to answer questions. If you have a question, you can use this. You're also free to leave. I'll shut my eye. Go run it. <laughs> Should I keep this on? Uh, oh, he's gone to, even the photo guy is five o'clock. Oh, there he is. Should I keep this on? Should I keep this on? Oh, uh, yeah. OK. Anybody ask me a question? Oh, uh, is the mic on? Oh, um, oh put, make sure you have the microphone. I got these hearing aids, but they're not perfect. Is this on? Yeah. No, it ain't. Speak in the mic for the On now? OK. So um, just uh, uh, I know it's kind of nitpicking, but you know you made a oh, yeah, very. I'm not hearing you. I might I might have to have this redacted by somebody with a deep okay. voice. I know it's kind of maybe nitpicking, but you know you made a very absolute statement at the beginning. You know about third party candidates, and I just had to let you know that Jill Stein's campaign manager walked out on you halfway through when you said Who that. Who did? <laughs> Jill Stein's campaign manager was, was that in the she room green? when you said that. No. What? Sorry. Huh? She disagreed. Uh, no, no, she's a green. She's a green. Yeah. Jill Stein. yeah. Yeah. So I. I was just wondering. If I, you thought she, I thought she was in a green party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Right. So that, I, I, I'm just curious. I wish you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on your uh, on your stance on why. If you're running that's it. As, a, as a green at the local level, yeah. that's fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not it, these rules that I'm talking about don't apply at the city level. Well. The Santa. <laughs> I get in trouble with Mickey Flax here, and that's really getting in trouble. You don't know that, but that's really getting in trouble for like 40 years. <laughs> but in any case, the point is that there's a lot of more flexibility at the local level on, on this issue. You don't have single member districts always and so on. So the hope has always been for the left, well, we'll build these local things and we'll move to the next level. But, it's, but the Democrats... See, the Democrats and the Republicans, neither one of them is going to allow this to happen. They have a reason to, to freeze third parties out. And so if you run against a Democrat, you are going to be uh, intensely disliked. And that's what happened to Nader. The feminist, Gloria Steinem, went up and down every state, including this state, bad-mouthing Nader. And Nader would say, I don't understand. I was a supporter of Ms. Magazine. I appeared on the cover of a mag. You can tell I've come to dislike Nader. But I think he did a lot of great things. But he stands for the dumbest politics in the world, if we're going to talk politics. You know. So Nader's saying, I don't understand. We're friends. And I've, 
the feminists knew that they'd be really hurt by Bush. All people of color didn't, no people of color voted for Nader. You'd think that'd be a clue that, ooh, I did sign for peace and freedom. Okay, I'm registered first, I voted, voted first time in my life for peace, peace and freedom in 68. I'm not so sure I did, I might have voted for Humphrey, but I was registered. And then I looked around, we had two, we had black candidates. Ain't no black people voting for that party. Surely a message in that, and went back to my political science buddies, and that's when I read the history and learned it, and it came to my views. Um, so the, the same thing happens to the Republicans, I want to tell you. The Republicans have lost governor, two governorships and three or four Senate seats since the mid-90s to libertarians. The reason there's a pretty liberal Democrat in, in a uh, Senate from Oregon is that a kind of guy that was a constitutional conservative got 5% of the vote. And so this guy Wyden won, the Democrat won with 48%. What does it take to understand that? I say it tells us the psychodynamics of leftists get too purist. On the other hand, you say, oh, and we used to talk that way, we'll be co-opted, we'll be co-opted. Well, we might be, but what's the choice? Are we gonna be co-opted or are we gonna elect George Bush and, and Nixon and so on? So, I, I, you know, I, so I'm done. I tried, in all the 70s, I argued this, and my friend Dick Flax argued this, and we had articles in leftist things, we thought everybody was gonna, you know, struggle within the Democratic Party, which has become a liberal labor party. It's a liberal labor ethnic party. It's the people that give it money are people that are in some way afraid of right-wing Christians. And it's a strange mix because it's Muslims and Jews and atheists and so on <laughs> that are, you know, scared of these right-wing people, even though they're rich. I mean, you know, rich isn't being everything if they're going to, you know, you know, uh, incarcerate us or, you know, harass us about our religion or burn down a temple, then we're not going to be crazy about being, putting those guys in charge. So this is a coalition of outgroups. Why wouldn't we be part of that coalition if we were leftists? Um, you can't tell that to a green, I know that. And I, but I say it, you know, some of you are younger people. You're still deciding who do you believe on what, what's the politic. You might say, God, I think I'll go back and read, read Gideon's Army. Uh, about the three volumes on the Progressive Party of 48. Tell me those people weren't courageous. Tell me those people weren't hardworking. Tell me those people didn't work night and day. They didn't screw, it wasn't they made mistakes, they were in a structural mess. You can't tell that to Nader. I probably, I could have probably handed him the book and he wouldn't have read it. So when this whole thing started back to third parties again, you could see I was like exasperated, right? And so I try to, in the nation, will they publish my article saying, Ralph, don't do this? Nah, 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 can't don't publish we have that. Like, historical so it's crazy. Precedent for this? What? Like, don't we have historical precedent for this? Like, we have what? Long ago, we have historical precedent for third parties changing system. What about like, I know Where, it's where's going, the precedent? It's like 1854, 1860, or sorry, 1856, 1860. And it's way back. In the back, face of, like, of enormous upheaval caused by the abolitionists and the whole uh, a jolt over slavery, there was, 